Please open your Bibles, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, we're going to look at verses 11 through 28. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another high priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed, of necessity there takes place a change of law also. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. And this is clearer still if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such, not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, thou art a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness. For if the law... For the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for they indeed became priests without an oath, but he with an oath through the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Thou art a priest forever. So much the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. And the former priests on the one hand existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, on the other hand, because he abides forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Hence also is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that he should have, <clears throat> that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and also then for the sins of the people because he, this he did once for all when he offered up himself for the law appoints men as high priests who are weak but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever let's pray our father in heaven we gathered together this morning to hear your word. And it is a good word. A word about Jesus. A word that clarifies to us just why he alone saves. And my hope and my prayer, Lord, is that you will impress this text upon the heart of all of us that those of us who are believers we would be gripped with the awesome responsibility of evangelism for there is no other way of salvation and if we are silent people will not be saved but for those in the room that are not yet Christians who are not yet trusting in Jesus Lord I pray that this text and your spirit would convince them that it is true that Jesus is the way of salvation and that they would trust in Him today. Father, we are dependent upon You. Please move upon us and help us to respond as we ought. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. <clears throat> How do you become perfect at something? I mean... If you really want to perfect something, how do you do that? Say if you're playing basketball and you wanted to be the best ball handler, able to dribble in and around people regardless of the pressure, if you wanted to be the best shot, if you wanted to be the best passer, able to pass the ball when, and it gets through people like a knife through butter, how, how do you do that? Well, it's practice, isn't it? Relentless practice over and over and over going over the drills and the skills until these 
habits become second nature until you are able to move with the ball without consciously thinking about what you're doing. It's as if your body just kind of goes into autopilot. It's the same with the individuals who practice for the Olympics. They want desperately to be the best, to be perfect. If you think of the gymnastic uh, individuals and their performance there on all those different, uh, different events that they have to do, they're aiming at perfection, to move and act in such a way that they are flawless, that their form is flawless. And so they train and train and train with great devotion and great sacrifice of time and, and other commitments. This becomes their life. We know that attaining perfection in, in, a, in a skill or in an event requires an extreme amount of devotion and diligence and effort and striving. And I think sometimes we apply that same idea to spirituality. That if we are to be perfect, then we must strive mightily. That we must give a great effort. That we must sacrifice and devote ourselves to pursuing this good, moral, upstanding life. That we apply ourselves with fervor to the religious activity that surrounds us here at the church. And so obtain perfection. What is this perfection that he is talking about in verse 11? When the whole passage is flowing out of this concept of perfection, where does this perfection come from? As you remember, the, the people that were listening to this letter for the first time were Jewish believers probably in Rome. And under the threat of persecution were contemplating returning to Judaism as the means by which they would be accepted by God that they would return to Judaism to find a safer place to obtain forgiveness of sins, a safer place to receive that acceptance from God so that they could dwell with him forever and ever. And the author of Hebrews is saying, is if you abandon Jesus, there is no hope for you. You must hold fast to Christ, lest you drift away from him. Why is he saying that? Because he understands something and he's trying to drive it deeper and deeper into our minds that Jesus Christ alone saves sinners. There's no other option. There's no other way. There's no other means by which you will obtain perfection. And what we mean by this perfection, what the author is talking about is forgiveness of sins and acceptance by God and dwelling in the new Jerusalem. This is the perfection that we're talking about. This better country, this better covenant of which Jesus is the better sacrifice. And he says in verse 11, now if this perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change in the law as well. If perfection could be acquired by means of religious devotion and uh, uh, um, spiritual service and uh, religious activity and, uh, and commitment to obedience to the law... <coughs> then why did Jesus come? Every religion in the world, and many who claim to be Christians, believe that perfection and eternal life and forgiveness of sins and acceptance with God, that it is obtained by human effort. We do something. We have to show the God that we are Serious that we have to show the gods that we are committed and devoted and diligent that we've got to attend more be more active <clears throat> But the reality Is that the very coming of Jesus into the world demonstrates that that is not true if 
If we could obtain a right standing with God by obedience to the law, if we could obtain a right standing with God by diligent moral living, if we could obtain a right standing with God by religious activity and devotion, if we could obtain a right standing with God by our charitable works, if we could obtain a right standing by God by doing anything ourselves, then why did Jesus come? The, the, the reality of the matter is Jesus came because we could not obtain perfection apart from supernatural grace. This is the point. And in this text, we have seven reasons you need to look to Christ instead of to your effort and your obedience and your devotion and your activity and your church attendance to make you acceptable to God. Seven reasons why you need to look to Christ and trust Christ and rely on Christ and hope in Christ. Number one, look to Christ because perfection does not come by means of human striving. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen by means of human striving. You cannot pay for your sins by being obedient to the Bible. You cannot pay for your sins by being a good church attender. You cannot pay for your sins by doing good and nice things in the community. You cannot pay for your sins by any other means except dying and going to hell. It's, it's that. That's it. The wages of sin is what? Death. And we're not just talking about physical death. We are talking about eternal death. We are talking about the kind of death that Revelation speaks of when it says the torment, their fire of their torment arises continually. The smoke of their torment continually rises to heaven. Our sin against God necessitates holy judgment. And that judgment is eternal hell the only way sin is paid for is through death the only way your bank loan is paid through for is through money you can't go down to the bank and say I have a few chickens I'd like to give you for this month's payment you can't go down to the bank and say you know what I'm just going to I'm just going to mow the lawn around the bank for a few weeks and pay for the to pay for the my note this week. The loan officer is going to look at you and say, "I think you're confused about how this works." There's only one form of payment acceptable, money. Real money. And the same is true spiritually. There's only one form of payment acceptable, death. So human striving doesn't get it. It doesn't cut it. It doesn't work. That's why the author says, if perfection were obtained through obedience to the law, then why did Jesus come? The very fact that Jesus comes shows us the only way our sin is paid for is through his death. Think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. What did he pray? Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. The cup of judgment that I'm about to drink, the hell that I'm about to endure for the sins of your people. If there's any other way to do this, Father, please let's do it that way. Jesus did not want to do this. This is not something he thought was no big deal. This was an unbelievable sacrifice upon him. And he said, if there's any other way. But he went to the cross because there was no other way. You see, sin will be paid for either by your death and experience of hell or Jesus' death and experience of hell on your behalf. It's the only way. It doesn't happen by human striving. So no amount of religious devotion, no amount of church attendance, no amount of charitable giving or moral living or any of that stuff can erase your sin. Only death and judgment erases sin. The very fact that Jesus has come demonstrates that obedience to the law doesn't work. So if you are looking to your 
religious devotion and good works as a means of standing right with God, you're going to be lost forever. Number two, look to Christ because He is the promised child of the Old Testament prophecy. He goes on to describe Jesus. He says, for the, the one in verse 13, for the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. Jesus is not a Levite. He's not a child of Aaron. And the Old Testament says only those individuals can serve as priests. But the very fact that Jesus has come shows that something greater than this priesthood is taking place. You see, many people think that the Old Testament was God's plan A, that the law he gave to Moses at, in Israel at Sinai was plan A, and because they didn't keep the law, then God had to bring in plan B, Jesus. But Jesus has been plan A the whole time. Do you remember in the Garden of Eden, what did God say to the snake? One day... The child of this woman will crush your head. The whole thing is going to be reversed. Everything is going to turn around. And these people that I'm banishing from my presence now are going to be brought back into my presence and we will live together forever and ever and ever. And this is going to happen through a particular child. And so throughout the whole Old Testament, we're looking for this particular child. And, and, and we're told that this child will come from the family of Abraham and be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Then we're told that this child will come from Judah, who is one of Abraham's grandchildren. The scepter, the ruler of the world, will be from Judah. And then it is from Judah that we see David arise as a preview of Jesus, who will be king, and all the nations will be servants of him. And David is told that one of your children will indeed reign forever. And then we come to Isaiah's prophecy. And on Isaiah, what does, the, what does the prophet tell us? That a day of gladness is coming. For a child will be born to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Prince of Peace and Mighty God, Eternal Father. This child will bring about salvation. He will usher in the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and the new earth. We see that in Isaiah 11. We see that in Isaiah 65. And he will do this by the sacrifice of himself, according to Isaiah 53. And then this child is born. This child is born and his name is Jesus. The only hope for humanity to escape from sin which started in Genesis 3, is the child promised in Genesis 3.15. And that child's name is Jesus. From the very beginning, the only way that we would have hope, the only escape we would have from sin is if this child came and crushed the head of the snake. And that is what he did when he died on the cross and rose again. Look to Christ because he's the child that God said would save. Number three, look to Christ because he has been resurrected to eternal life. Look at verse 15. And this is clearer still. If another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such, not on the basis of a law, of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus didn't become high priest. Jesus didn't become the representative of humanity because of his physical lineage. He became the representative of humanity because of his resurrection. By the power of a life that cannot be ended, Jesus stands eternally in the presence of God representing us. Think about it like this. The, the, the reason Jesus saves is because Jesus lives. Sin 
necessitates death. And sin necessitates a death of such magnitude that hell is the only experience that actually pays for that sin. And so Jesus experiences that death. He experiences that judgment, that hell in our place. And the way that we know that Jesus actually fully and completely paid off the sin debt is that he came back to life. If he were still dead, he would still be paying for sins. It's only when you get that notice in the mail from the bank with the mortgage says paid in full stamped across the top that you know you don't have any more payments left. That receipt, that paid in full statement is what the resurrection is. The resurrection is the evidence that God has accepted Jesus' death as full, satisfying payment for all our sins. That there is no more sin left to pay for. That's why the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no judgment. There's no hell. There's no death. There's no separation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because Jesus died and then rose again, demonstrating that death paid for everything. This is why Jesus said that everyone who looks to him will be saved. This is why Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me will live even if he dies. Jesus, Jesus is the priest that actually satisfies God's justice and judgment. You see, the Old Testament priests... They kept sacrificing and sacrificing and sacrificing and sacrificing. Why? Because sin wasn't paid for. As we'll learn later, the blood of animals can never satisfy a hell payment of sin. Only an infinite person can do that, and Jesus did. Look to Christ because his resurrection proves God accepted his payment. Number four, look to Christ because he successfully brings us into the presence of God. Verse 18 says, For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. The old covenant, the old law, the old priesthood is set aside because it's weak, it's useless, it doesn't actually bring people into the presence of God. Your human effort, your church attendance, your religious activity, your moral behavior, it's all useless, it's all weak as a means of getting you into the actual presence of God. It's like trying to dig through a concrete floor with a plastic beach shovel. It doesn't work. No matter how hard you pound on that concrete floor, your, your shovel will break. No matter how hard you try to live a good, moral, obedient life, no matter how much church you attend, no matter how much money you give, no matter how kind you are in the community, it doesn't get you into the presence of God any more than that plastic shovel gets you through that concrete wall. You need a jackhammer. And Jesus is the jackhammer that plunges through the concrete, shattering it, destroying it, creating a hole through which you come into the presence of God. It is through Him, a better hope, a more confident hope, a a, a guarantee that we can gain access to God through Jesus Christ. I mean, the whole goal of salvation is to live with God. To be in the presence of God. And your good deeds don't do it. The only one that can bring you into the presence of God is Jesus. He successfully does it. Which is why he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. No one. There's no other way. There's no other way in. He alone breaks through the concrete barrier of our sin and God's justice and brings us into the presence of God. Number five, look to Christ because He is the guarantee 
of eternal forgiveness. Look at verse 20. And inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for they indeed became priests without an oath, but he with an oath, through the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, thou art a priest forever, so much the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. A guarantee is the surety that no matter what happens, you're good. You buy a guarantee so that you don't lose your money if the product goes bad. The guarantee that you are eternally saved is Jesus. Because God promised that everyone who believes in Jesus will not perish but have everlasting life. God swore an oath that Jesus was the means of salvation and that everyone who comes to him would be saved. He is the access point. He is the one who makes atonement for sin. And there's no other. And the reality that makes Jesus the guarantee is that God doesn't change his mind. He swore an oath. He swore an oath so that there's no possibility of change. I mean, God can't lie, so he's, he's not going to change his mind that way. But at the same time, he, he puts himself under an oath, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, for our benefit to know without a shadow of a doubt, there's no chance that God will ever change his mind and say, you know what? Jesus isn't good enough anymore. Jesus isn't the way of salvation anymore. You know, Jesus did a great thing for you. He got you most of the way there, but now you've got to do X, Y, and Z. You've got to find another way in. Too many people came in through Jesus. We've exhausted all the resources. You've got to find another way in. It's not ever going to happen. Jesus is the guarantee that the way of salvation is through him and that everyone who comes through him will be saved. And God's never going to change that because he swore an oath. He said, you are priest forever. You are the access point forever. You are the one who makes atonement forever. Your sacrifice is good forever. Your righteousness stands before me forever. You are saved if you are in Christ forever. I mean, he just builds on this. The next point is that we ought to look to Christ because he's the permanent priest who saves forever. Look what he says in verse 23. Now the former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, on the other hand, because he abides forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Hence also he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. There's a permanency about Jesus, an unchangingness about Jesus. He's never going to... If you decided for your family vacation you were going to go to the Grand Canyon, you get your map out and you locate the Grand Canyon, you don't have the, you don't have the stop and think, you know, what, if, what did, did, the Grand, did the Grand Canyon move this year? Is it in Texas now? No. Why? Because it doesn't move. It's always there where it's supposed to be. It's permanent. It's not going to move to Montana one year and then come back to Arizona. It, it doesn't work like that. It's always there. It's a permanent fixture. Jesus is a permanent fixture in the presence of God as the means of salvation to all who call on His name. You don't ever have to wonder... Well, maybe Jesus isn't the way anymore. Maybe Jesus doesn't save anymore. No. He is the permanent high priest because he never dies. You see, Jesus is not going to die and then another high priest come up and the way you get in through this high priest is different than the way you get in by trusting Jesus. It doesn't work. Jesus lives forever and because he lives forever, the way to salvation is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But another, I mean, look at what he says here. Hence also, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him. Who is he saving forever? Those who draw near to God through him. If you draw near to, if you try to draw near to God, through your good deeds, through your church attendance, through your kindness, through your feelings, you won't get there. 
But if you draw near through him, you will. And the reason is because he always lives to make intercession for you. You see, in order to live in the presence of God, you have to be perfect. You have to have a perfect life of righteousness, perfect obedience. Are you perfect? Just raise your hand if you're perfect. If you raise your hand, you just blew it. There is none of us can stand before God and say, I'm perfect. I, I have lived without sin from the day I was conceived until the day I died. I never had a sinful thought, never had a sinful word, never did a sinful deed. There's only one man who is sinless. Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he stands in the presence of God permanently as our representative so that his life counts as our lives. It's as if we are all standing there collectively in him. But we're not standing there on the basis of our deeds and our righteousness, which we don't have. We are standing there on the basis of his righteousness. God accepts us because Jesus is perfect. And he will always stand there and always represent you. And so you will always be saved. You know, Jesus is never going to die and then God come up and say, hey, your righteousness is gone. As long as Jesus stands in heaven, no one can tell you to depart. That's good. He's the permanent priest who saves forever. And lastly, Look to Christ because he is the sinless priest and the once for all sacrifice for sin. Verse 26, it says, For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like these high priests, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. Look to Jesus. Because he's not like these sinful men who are weak and unable to really atone for your sin. No, Jesus actually dealt with your sin by giving himself. He had no sin of his own to pay for, And so he could walk into the presence of God and that he did and he brought into the presence of God his own blood, his own life as payment for all our sins. I heard a preacher one time describe this payment and this work of Jesus like this. Let's just suppose for a moment you are standing right in front of the Hoover Dam and behind it Lake Mead represents the judgment of God for your sin. At any moment, that dam could break and the water from that lake would just destroy you. There's no way you could run. There's no way you could escape fast enough. There's nothing you could hold on to and ride out it. You would just be pulverized into nothingness by the torrential flow of water. And so that dam begins to break and then it just explodes in a moment and you realize there's nothing you can do to stop it. There's nothing you can do to escape it. There's no way around it. There's no way out. You are done for. And then Jesus steps in front of you. And all of that water that represents God's judgment, all of it, every single drop of it is absorbed into Christ. It slams into Christ who stands there in your place. And He absorbs it with such Success that not one single drop touches you. By the sacrifice of himself, he saved you. He absorbed God's infinite wrath for your sin. He drank down that cup, turned it over and said, It is finished. There's nothing left to pay for. Your sins are actually paid for when Jesus died on the cross. So look to Christ and be saved. 
Who are you looking to as your means of gaining forgiveness and gaining access to heaven? What's your guarantee that you are right with God? Will you stand before God on judgment day? And what will shield you from His wrath? If you think that your good deeds and your obedience and your kindness and your moral life will shield you from God's judgment, it will shield you about as effectively as a gasoline-soaked blanket will shield you from a roaring house fire. It, it won't work. You will be consumed. Only Christ absorbs God's judgment so that not one drop touches you. Only Jesus stands in the presence of God as a perfectly righteous man and that perfect righteous man is considered to be you. You are in Him. He represents you. And so long as He stands there, you are right with God. And He will never stop standing there because He is the permanent high priest who has been resurrected and who lives forever. The question is, are you looking to Christ or are you looking to something else? I want you to close your eyes. I want everybody to close your eyes because I want you to think in this moment and I want you to be distracted. Who or what are you trusting right now? Some of you have been playing with this decision of whether or not to trust in Christ for a long time. And you keep thinking, I'll get to it later. Do you not understand that you will die and go to hell without Christ and there's nothing you can do to stop it? There's no way to escape it. The only hope any human being on this planet has is Jesus Christ. Why do you delay? Why do you wait? You, in the, 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 the privacy of your own mind right now, answer that question, why are you waiting to trust Christ? We're going to give you an opportunity in just a moment as Pastor John leads us in a song for you to trust Christ. There's nothing sacred about walking down this aisle, but I would invite you to walk down here and talk to one of our pastors. They can take you to a room just outside these doors and sit quietly and privately, answer your questions and help you understand what it means to trust Christ. Or you can sit there and you can refuse to repent of your sin and trust Jesus and you can go and you will perish. There is nothing, there is nothing in this life more important than this moment now that you trust Jesus. Oh, that God would give you the grace to respond. Let's pray.